students do that, we don't tell them that we are going to put those three components together. Mm -hmm. Then we put them together, we compile a clip, which usually takes something like 10 minutes, and play it back to the class, and it's very difficult for them to accept that this is something that they have created. <laughs> then, when I came to SDAS, I ran into an interesting issue with highly skilled composers who like to control their material. When we do this in Hong Kong, where students are using English as a second language, I have a very good excuse for engaging in a conversation with the students about their poetry, mm -hmm. which allows filling in bits and pieces, polishing up grammar and things like that, without destroying what they create and without destroying their sense of ownership of the material. I tried to do the same thing here, and I suggested bits and pieces of changing to the language. In many cases, that was refused. I was not allowed to touch the material and to mess with it. And also, it seems that English native speakers are much more tolerant to very confusing English. And that's what this clip is about. Especially when listening to this on headphones, it's very skillful. The only thing that's in there, I believe, is a human voice. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of skill, but one of the questions that emerges from this is how do you get a master of a tool mm -hmm. to use that tool and to look at what he or she is creating in the way that a child would look mm -hmm. at it again. Mm -hmm. Then there's also very thin lines between professional competence, biting sarcasm, and simple <laughs> failure to invite chance. We don't know. What's going on? Yeah, what's, what's going on? What is he trying to tell us? One interesting thing is, coming back to the satisfaction with the teaching, is what are we looking for as teachers? If we preach unpredictability, if we preach unconstrainedness, how do we judge what comes back? How, how do we make yeah, our opinion up about this? And I think we, in talking about it, we agreed that we would like to see students making choices or seeing new choices like seeing new opportunities, new possibilities where before there were none, maybe, or just few. Then also making some choices that are maybe also risky and taking responsibility exactly for those choices. By taking responsibility, we mean you have to reflect and you have to think about, you have to explain it, you have to take ownership and you maybe also have to justify what you write about. And this, is, this comes out mainly in the written assignments that we will also show some examples later. So this is again just a little instance uh, related to the seeing. We've shown a lot of examples for seeing and inviting the unintended uh, to students. So the top one you maybe know is uh, a Warshach blotch, um, which are used to invite exactly this kind of new seeing. Then uh, the below examples, the left one, are the white paintings by Robert Rauschenberg, who introduced the observer and the dialogue between observer and painting, because a painting is never blank, can never be blank if you take the observer into account. Interestingly, in Chinese gardens, because we, we teach Chinese students and they have a kind of basic intuition about this, in Chinese gardens, the white walls, if you look closely, have a great deal of this role to perform as well. Mm -hmm. They serve multiple functions, and one of these functions also to give you space mm -hmm. to see. You make it white. One little, how do you say that? An aphorism, An aphorism maybe, maybe that we use. To use. Is he or she who enters the forest to look for mushrooms may maybe find mushrooms, but 
will almost certainly miss the birds, which means if you focus, you will not see. And with, along with that goes a problem with the visual paradigm that is usually used in this context. We're talking about seeing and vision, but in talking about seeing, we often ignore the active component of that. So we like to look at a blind person instead who's using the stick to probe the environment as an, an active gesture. It's something that is thrown out in the world or that's thrown against the wall in the first place in order to see whether something sticks. In what the students give us back in the end when they go through the writing assignments, there are different levels of satisfaction with the uh, material that comes back. This one is basically a very simple rephrasing of some of the things we said accompanied with image bank illustrations, which taste like parroting. It's very difficult to judge what's really going on. There's very little transformation, very little claiming of ownership and application of what is quoted here. This is a different one. This came back as a video. When I was small, I made a painting that looked like this. It was in my primary school art lesson where we were asked to draw a teapot set. I was always drawn in painting, and this time, after it was finished, I was very satisfied with my art piece and expected to receive a very high score. However, I just got a pass for my painting, and my teacher commented that it was not realistic, it can't function this way. To a seven-year-old girl, this was devastating. Why can't I have my teapot like this? Water froze down, and with the teapot spout positioned this way, water can flow out without any effort. Very intuitive and surely functional. I later realized that this is what happens very often in our society. Creativity is suppressed. This one is from a student who is himself a design lecturer. And he writes, as a design lecturer, I have the following description of what I am doing. I am using a planned strategy as a tool for killing innovation of the students in order to trigger the experienced, expected, presupposed, and problem-solving based outcomes for students to equip well with a strategy of using the appropriate tools on the problem-solving tasks related to design. Yeah, no comment. <laughs> this one is a project manager who writes about all sorts of things, in particular about uncertain beauty. We are not entirely sure of what he's talking about, but it seems to have become a, an important concept throughout the subject to him. And he's putting a lot of his own photography next to his writings about uncertain beauty. He's talking about how evil the undo function in software is because it erases all the mistakes. And then when he reflects on his own work as a project manager, he's writing, Recently, I have started to change my project management attitudes, assigning projects to different designers as before, accommodating two designers in one project to enhance skills, interactivity, working with designers for sharing my abilities as well as theirs. Though the results will not be improved obviously and instantly, at least the company's creative environment is changing. I believe the uncertain beauty must come out in some days. Thank you very much.